two of Cases in Place is actually our first interview today. So I'm really excited to um, be kicking off you guys in a real way this semester. Um, I know we had some technical issues last week, so I just want to quickly say, you know, are you guys able to A, chat, B, talk, raise your hand, all that kind of stuff? Anyone having any issues before we move forward? I hear, I've heard a couple of you sign on, so I feel like that means we're in good shape. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Awesome. Great. Well, so to kick off, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping things. I don't believe I actually have any new students this week, um, but if, if you weren't here last week, please make sure to sidebar with me at the end of class and I can make sure that you're fully caught up. But uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to go over quickly um, schedule and attendance and how um, the assignments that are currently due so that you guys are all on the same page. And I'm also going to mute everyone who is not muted yet. Okay. So um, schedule and attendance, just so you guys know, the link opens at 4. Um, just class uh, announcements begin now. And starting at 4.15, the lecture begins with our guests. And you would be officially tardy if you were not signed on yet. Um, cutoff happens at 4.30, so no longer allowing anyone in the class at that time. And at 6 o'clock, at the end of class, when I'm done lecturing, I will post a question and have you guys email it to me for the end of class. I'm sorry, this uploaded so funny. It's all um, crooked. But fashion event critiques, um, you need to attend two fashion-related exhibits or events this semester by October 12th. Um, and the assignment is posted on Blackboard and should be filled out on Blackboard. Um, you have questions that you need to answer about the event and then upload ticket, program, and image. Um, I also, this semester, am accepting uh, viewing of certain documentaries uh, that are fashion related. I've posted here a list that I think is strong. I also put this on the Blackboard directly under content. Um, that said, if you have other ones that are outside this list and you want to shoot me an email, make sure that's okay with me. That works too. It just, uh, the intent is that it's educational and purpose, obviously more of a documentary than um, a fiction movie story, you know, Devil Wars Prana doesn't exactly count. Um, and the intent of this assignment is really to get you guys thinking like industry professionals uh, and thinking criti uh, creatively and critically about what you see out in the world as it relates to fashion. Lecture prep questions, again, sorry for the way it showed up here, but lecture prep questions can be completed from now until the last lecture on December 14th. Uh, asking four relevant questions, sending them to me in, ahead of class. So if you have not sent them to me yet for this class, uh, your time is up. But make sure you send them in by 4:10 if you want to uh, if you want to submit for a certain class. And then you need to answer one of the questions during the lecture and email it back to me as soon as possible after the lecture is over. Uh, it should all be on the same email chain, and this is pretty important because otherwise I get really uh, you know confused looking through my inbox. So make sure that if you did send me your lecture prep questions, you write back on that same email chain uh, with your answer after the lecture happens. Are there any questions on this one? Another note as well, you don't have to have turned in questions to ask a question on any given day. So if you have a dying question for Sergio today and you did not actually send any questions in advance, do not worry about that at all. Feel free to ask whatever you'd like. Even if you did send in your questions and you feel like you want to ask a different question than the ones you had prepared because something came up in the lecture, that's totally fine too. Obviously, we're we're not trying to, um, I'm not trying to limit your guys' chance to speak with our guests. Sharon, did you have a question? Yes, hi. Um, good afternoon. Just quickly, the the back and forth um, of questions and emails, um, is it, would it not be possible to do this on Blackboard in a Dropbox so that it's all in one place? Because we're sort of inundated with email too, um, so I can see how things will get um, confusing. It's a good suggestion. Um, this is a this is a system that worked well for me last semester, but let me think on it to see if there's a better way after today after going back and forth. But thank you. <laughs> Anything else, Muriel? I, I'm here. I'm sorry. I, I don't know why my Blackboard Collaborate wasn't showing class, but I'm here. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Sorry, I don't know how to use technology. 
All right, so moving forward, attendance process. Um, your attendance will begin at 410, and I will use the log from this class to so make sure that you're showing up appropriately, which it looks like most people's are. Um, if it's not right for today, then maybe with your attendance answer, just shoot me a note about that. And for next go around, um, try to have your full name in there so that I can ensure that you were here. Okay. Social media, I sent you guys an email last week to get you following where this class is happening. I think it's super important that you do follow along. Number one, there'll be some extra credit posted there, but um, at the same time, it helps you to stay engaged after this class is over so that if you do want to come back for a lecture, you're able to. Kylie, did you have a question? Sorry, uh, for my, I couldn't get my audio to work. Um, it was about the lecture prep questions. Yeah. Um, so what exactly is that? Because when I was looking on the Blackboard, um, like trying to find where everything is, um, where it says professor name, like your name is not there. So I don't know if I'm in like the wrong class on Blackboard, but I just couldn't see anything. Um, so it's posted on Blackboard under content, and it's a Word document that's called uh, Lecture Prep Questions. Um, okay. And what you should do is fill out this in advance of class, write down four questions that you want to ask whatever guest that you are, you know, that you would like to speak about. And um, during the course of that class, make sure that you ask one of those questions and then answer, write down your answer to that question and send it back to me. Um, so it, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear out there under content. It's listed as lecture preparation questions and my name is listed there. So I, don't, I don't know, maybe take another peek and let me know if you're still having issues. Yeah, because when I, when I go into the Faces and Places page, um, where it says instructor, I have Professor Joshua Williams. <laughs> this is um, on Blackboard under content. Yep. I actually, I actually saw that too. Like I see your name under the course, but I saw Joshua Williams at one point. So I, I had that issue with what Kylie's talking about before too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mine, mine doesn't even say your name at all. It just says Joshua Williams and his email. On lecture, on the faces and places, like on Blackboard, you're saying? Yep, under course information on faces and places. That's bizarre. Yes. Yeah, it does. It is it, 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 yeah. oh, there. Under five. Okay, I see where you guys are. Um, you should be under content uh, is where I posted everything, but it looks like whatever's under course information was carried over from a different time, so I will make sure to delete out anything that's not relevant there. It's probably because they, they when they copy over the courses in Blackboard, it's probably from a couple semesters ago or something like that. But if you go under content, not course information, content, that's everything that I've uploaded. Thank you for the call out. That's good to know about. And I'll make sure that gets corrected. Thank you, Professor. No problem. All right. So moving along. Um, Remote guidelines, just a couple of reminders from last week, and everyone seems to be following along great so far, but make sure you use the raise your hand button if you want to speak, and feel free to type feel free to type immediate questions in the chat function if, if you feel like it's, it's really important that it gets asked immediately. Um, if you're going to speak at the end of the lecture when it's time for asking questions, please make sure to turn on your camera, um, and if you raise your hand, please preemptively turn on your camera so there's not so long of a gap when you start to speak. And unmute only when you begin to speak. Um, and just a reminder that all classes are being recorded. So, you know, keep that in mind for yourself. Any questions? Okay, so our schedule, as you guys know, we have um, Sergio Guadarrama here today, who is an owner for Celestino Couture. He was also on Project Runway last uh, season. So I think he, he is a truly exciting guest you guys are going to really love chatting with. Next week, we have Maria Hooperin, who's a costume designer in film, television, and theater. And the following week, another break with Yom Kippur, but the week following that, we'll have Karen um, Sabag on, who's a designer um, in New York City. You can see the rest of the schedule here, too. If you have any questions, feel free to jump in or let me know. So just a couple of notes on sustainability, as I think uh, you will find that Sergio is a very great expert on this topic. And I think it probably uh, goes without saying that in all of your courses and in everywhere you look and everything you're reading about fashion right now, it's really difficult to avoid this thing. 
uh, it's a really top of mind thought in any large company or small company or honestly anyone who's launching a company right now. Uh, it in this day and age, I think it it goes without saying that you're going to be taking sustainable message, uh, sustainable missions forward with you uh, to be successful. It's important. It's becoming increasingly important to the customer, and it's becoming a much bigger mindset in the way things are done. Just a kind of uh, little chart here on seven main ways in which customers are becoming more uh, sustainable and which companies are thinking more about sustainability. Um, the first being on-demand and custom-made, which I think uh, Sergio was able to touch on greatly as every piece that he designs actually has a buyer in place already so that he has no waste, no excess at the end of a season. And um, going green and clean, so thinking more about the uh, what you are doing, what kind of product you're making, and what it's doing to waterways, what kind of um, breakdown the product is going to have after the fact, how, what type of poly bags you're using or not using, um, and using recycled materials in that sense. Um, high quality and timeless design. I think there's a lot of talk about making purchases that are going to last a long time, kind of an a, attack on fast fashion. This idea that you wear it and throw it away uh, is becoming increasingly less and less popular. Um, fair and ethical, obviously, um, it's super important for a lot of companies, and they've been thinking about this in a bigger way, how they're treating their uh, employees throughout the world and how they are compensating them and thinking more and more about that. Uh, repair, redesign, and upcycle. Uh, this is another thing that Sergio is really fabulous with, taking pieces that uh, are from previous designs or previous things, uh, you know, whether it's actually an article of clothing before, and turning it into something that's new and a new beautiful piece of fashion. Um, renting has become a very popular form of decreasing your fashion footprint, um, leasing and swapping. I think Rent the Runway was really first and uh, out the gate with this, but there's more and more companies that have been rising to the top and figuring out ways to do this, including Amazon. And secondhand and vintage uh, is has always been uh, around as a really unique way to build out your fashion uh, look, but I think it's also, there have been new ways to do it online that have come out in recent years. And um, there's been a really big growth in this area of business as secondhand shops uh, become sexier to the mainstream people. This is a really fun quiz that ThreadUp, sustain, uh, sustainability quiz that they put live. ThreadUp, if you're not familiar with it, is, is a model of a company that's doing a great job of being sustainable online. And um, they, they kind of release a quiz to kind of ask yourself, what sort of damage am I doing as far as uh, fashion sustainability goes every single um, year? And what, you know, what kind of gives you suggestions for how to do it better? Does anyone have questions before I move forward? Okay. Just a couple of great resources here. Again, these would be great for your... Um, for your assignment for fashion critiques, but the true cost, if you have not seen it yet, is a great documentary that really talks to you about what fast fashion is kind of doing to our world and how no one really thought about uh, the earth as a resource that is, you know, fine and we, we need to take better care of it. I also came across this one last semester called Traceable. It's a more, uh, it may feel very true to, to you guys. It's a student who is, uh, you know, kind of studying the industry, and she goes over to India and really uh, gets down to the root of things from a sustainable standpoint. And with that, I would love to introduce Sergio to you guys. Um, for those of you who are familiar with him last uh, last season in Project Runway, Sergio Celestino Guadarrama and Kay Johnson are creating the world of Celestino with precisely crafted, eco-conscious, and fashion-forward women's and men's collections. Established in 2005, the company unites classical couture techniques with innovative concepts, upcycled luxury fabrics, and unconventional details to create the aesthetic of Celestino. The Celestino Atelier prides itself on being fully inclusive to all sizes and providing an intimate, personalized, unique experience for each client. The company makes a conscious effort to design garments that are tailored to each client's specific body type and sense of style, an upheld tradition true to the ways of Poke Couture. The brand currently operates its atelier in Hudson, New York. 
Celestino believes in designing with a purpose, maintaining a strong socially conscious mentality, and standing up for the environmental and political issues that affect the United States and beyond. Each design is created with hidden messages in order to bring awareness to social causes and in turn prompt others to assist in resolving them. As a company, Celestino recognizes that fashion and the environment have to coexist. In an effort to be an environmentally sustainable brand, they stray away from the creation of textiles, exclusively using upcycled materials, dead stocked fabrics left over from the fashion industry, and other findings. Sergio and Kate pride themselves in designing for clients of all sizes and ages. Their goal is to empower each individual as they step into a Celestino garment. After graduating from the prestigious Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising in LA, Sergio Celestino Guarama continued his love of studying at the prominent FIT Institute of Technology in New York City. While in school, he worked with private clients and won numerous fashion design accolades, including the inaugural Sapima Cotton Design Competition. Sergio's skills were further refined during his freelance work at the Metropolitan Opera, which gave him hands-on experience to build his craft. While freelancing, he had the privilege of, to work on productions such as Madame Butterfly and Magic Flute, where he developed knowledge of old world techniques, gaining expertise in a dying art, and truly understanding how to drape for the human body. Sergio and Cade pride themselves in using their creations to convey messages that inspire others to take a stand for social causes. Together, they embrace the culture of the LGBTQ plus community and aspire to be positive role models within the fashion industry. They make a conscious effort as a company to be inclusive to all individuals, regardless of gender, entity, or sexual orientation, and donate time and a portion of their profits to humanitarian organiza organizations. Sergio and Cade make it their responsibility to mentor up, coming, up and coming designers and students from FIT, the University of Texas, and High School of Fashion Industries, Parsons School of Design, and Pratt Institute as a way of passing on valuable knowledge for future generations. Each look that is created in the Celestino Atelier is not only designed, but also hand created by both Sergio and Kate. So with that, I would love to turn it over to Sergio. Are you there, Sergio? No, he was. So, okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. How are you guys doing remotely. today? <laughs> you pretty much summed up everything that I do. Like, oh, so you definitely have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, is there any specific topics that your students are interested in that I can delve into just to see? Because I honestly, I hate talking about myself, but if they're interested, like even talking about sustainability, that would be fun. Yeah, definitely. Um, Somebody I said vegan fabric. Yeah. yeah. So that's actually a great um, like topic. What people don't realize is a lot of vegan fabrics are actually more toxic, not only for the local environments that they're created in, but they they don't decompose. Um, unfortunately, like I never want to harm any animals, but leather is a lot more sustainable, honestly, than any type of vegan fabric. Like the processes of creating vegan textiles is actually super toxic. So those Stella McCartney bags that are vegan and ethical are actually sometimes more damaging to like a local um, like forest, wherever they're creating these products, it gets into the waterways, it gets into, it's just a very polluting process. And so vegan fabrics are actually not very sustainable. And that's a misconception that we have within our industry. I guess, um, if we can, I'll take a moment to do student questions at the end, but I want to, I actually want to start off with a couple of my questions. My, my okay. first one was a little bit more detail around your career. Okay. Um, you had a really interesting start starting uh, with the Met and would love to hear a little bit about, about that experience. Yeah, so um, I actually started my company while I was at, still at FIT. So I was a junior at FIT. And the one thing that I notice about our industry is that it's a very hard place. Sometimes it can be a negative and toxic environment because when creative people are pushed into creativity just for financial gains, it doesn't make it like, I don't know, it kind of kills creativity and that's why I feel like fashion is very boring right now because 
we're creating just for profit margins and that's really the only thing driving fashion at the moment and so once i started my line my junior year i i wanted to learn from a place that does things like the couture houses in paris and the met in the united states was one of the last places that was creating garments in those couture techniques but also for real people if you look at all the variations of opera singers they're not runway models and i felt like that was really really important for me to learn not only to make beautiful clothing but make it on people of all backgrounds and all sizes and that's something that we don't really learn a lot while we're in school but i knew that that was something that would set me apart from other designers that's great um and I should, I feel like I should also make the comment, you are the first guest that I've ever had back to class because <laughs> I, loved, I loved talking to you last year, last semester and Sergio, just so you guys are aware, came in to my class, I think it was March 9th. So like that week before the world was shutting down. <laughs> and um, it was also the week that Project Runway season finale was airing and you had like a show prepare, you know, an event prepared that I think you had to cancel at the last second. And yeah, it was, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really awesome to have you here in, in this environment, even though it's obviously not as great as in the flesh, but um, anyway, I think you guys will really love hearing more about all of this. Um, so when did you get your idea for your company? Obviously you started about getting it off the ground in college, but but when did it first kind of come to you that you wanted to do what you're doing? I've, I've honestly felt like I've done this like many lifetimes. Ever since I was a little boy, I've always been obsessed with making things with my hands. And once that I even understood that you could be a designer, I grew up in a really small town in Texas and there, there wasn't any fashion. There wasn't anything that even referenced fashion. And so I've always just been making little clothes and different things without any support and just kind of figuring it out on my own and not until i think i got into high school did i realize that you could make a career out of fashion design it was just it was we were either lawyer doctor teacher fireman like the the very narrow scope that you're that you're introduced to while you're in middle school elementary and so once i got i uh I got accepted into FITM my sophomore year of high school. That's kind of when I just started gearing my entire life for fashion. Great. And what do you feel like the biggest challenges were about getting yourself started? Even as a company? As a company, yeah. As a company, um, I'm trying to think. I don't know. I'm very... Uh, I have a very strong direction in terms of, I, because I've known I've always wanted to do this, I've never given myself any sort of range for failure. And I've just kind of bulldozed through any obstacles. I would, I would say probably the biggest obstacle in our industry is that it takes a lot more time to be successful if you're doing things in a sustainable, environmentally friendly way um and ethically made products um i mean i could have already made a ton of money creating products but they would not fall in line with with both the sustainability and the ethically produced um when you're ethically producing stuff um it, it's a little bit more expensive and it takes a lot more time to create and then also the sustainably sustainability aspect of it sometimes adds cost and so it's really hard to make both of those things for the masses. It's it's not the H&M. H&M or Zara will never be into those places. And even designer companies like Stella McCartney that claim to be sustainable, they've gotten in a lot of trouble just pushing product through to for their profit margins. They're owned by the Gucci group and they've gotten in trouble for paying their workers like $2 or $1 an hour creating these like thousands of dollar garments. And so that is honestly not a reality. Um, to be sustainable and ethical, you're going to be smaller no matter what. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a question out there in the chat. Um, can you elaborate on what you mean by ethically producing versus not? 
Well, ethically producing is paying somebody a livable wage for where they're living. So, and that does depend on where you're producing your products. Kate and I make all of our own stuff, so it's on our backs, but you can produce ethically uh, ethical products even in the United States or in other countries, as long as you know um, that the factory or the manufacturer creating, make sure that they're completely transparent. Um, if the factory is not completely transparent, you are never guaranteed to know how they're cutting corners, making your products or not paying the people producing your products fairly. So it's really the future of trans or of our industry is transparency, not only knowing what farm your fabrics are, 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 are your textiles are, uh, the fibers are being sourced from, to who's making the fiber, to who's cutting and sewing your product like all the way down the road is really the only way that you can guarantee ethical and sustainable products is with that transparency. If they don't provide it, then it's probably not the reality. Yeah, and actually, if you have not, I know I just made the plug on this, but if you guys have not seen True Cost, it's, and that's another reason to watch that because they really go into that quite a bit. And I think it's just very eye-opening what, what's happening overseas if you haven't worked in the industry yet to, to really see what's, what it looks yeah. like. Most most clothing in the lower price point uh, like directions are actually made by slaves. Like really, that's that's what you're paying for. That five dollar T-shirt at Walmart is guaranteed made by some sort of indentured person um, because there's no way you can create those products for that low of a cost. Um, what what do you feel like has been the most rewarding about having launched your own company? I think the most rewarding thing is being able to create without uh, having that pressure of like the five or ten percent profit margins that a lot of these other companies have because i can just create and really create the world that i envision which uh, like we use fashion as a vehicle to make change and when you stand for things, sometimes that does cause discourse, that does cause you, not everybody to like your brand because you're actually making a stand for what you believe in. And so, I mean, we we don't cater to everyone um, in terms of like what they represent politically because we feel like there is a right and a wrong of what happens within our country and the world and when you stand up for that your your customers do go more narrow but that makes not only kate and i more happy but we can do it in the way that we want to and that's really what hopefully future designers create your own version of your truth and that's kind of how we look at it is our truth um, so as I mentioned before, the last time we met was when COVID was just hitting, and I'm curious to hear how you guys have navigated through this last crazy six months. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually moved our studio um, from, uh, we were in South Street Seaport, up to upstate just because we started not only to identify um, a lot of what I mean, there's there COVID's going to be something that's going to be with us for a while. And we just wanted to reconnect with nature and um, just create in a different place. And the good thing with social media is that now that you're a designer, you don't have to be in New York City to be successful or do any creative project that you want. You can be anywhere in the world that makes sense to what makes you happy. And so I really want to uh, stress to you, like, this industry at any point shouldn't make you stressed or unhappy of what you're doing. This should be your passion that you should celebrate. And if you're in a place that has those negative connotations, you should shift left or right and figure out where, what makes sense for you as a budding designer. I want, I mean, I want the world to be a million designers instead of like the few little brands that are out there or the few big brands that kind of control everything. That's great. And how how have you found it adjusting to Hudson? And did, did you were you already kind of half in Hudson before or was this a total No, we I had just visited once and I 
fell in yeah. love. It's a very progressive town, and they do support a lot of local creative energy. And we're actually creating a factory here with a partnership with the city um, and bringing manufacturing back into New York. COVID has really put out there what our system is lacking. And manufacturing our own products is really a place where, I mean, Wall Street really sold out all of our manufacturing centers in the 80s um, for profits. And we're making a sustainable and an ethically driven nonprofit factory here in Hudson to create products for future designers. That's amazing. Isn't Hudson doing a test with the universal salary? Yes. Well, yeah, they're doing tests. They're doing, and they're also reallocating funds from the police to make other social programs more available to people under stress. And the factory we're creating, it's going to target people transitioning out of incarceration, women exiting domestic violence situations, uh, younger people exiting uh, the foster care system. So we've really identified groups um, that are being unheard and supported at the moment and really um, giving them opportunities to be like really productive um, people for their community. And this is like a test and there's already other cities um, trying to mimic the system that we're creating. Um, Dallas is already trying to do it. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome, really great. And it is a beautiful part of the world. I'm a little biased from close to Albany, so. <laughs> one stop more on the train. <laughs> um, so what would you say is your style philosophy as a general overarching? Well, the human body has been the same for a very long time. So I feel like there are certain silhouettes and things that look really flattering to a great range of people. And so I like to take the best of what's worked in the past and reinvent it for the future. So it's like a classic uh, silhouette with a modern twist is really how I, I feel like I can design. And that also helps with sustainability because you're creating more timeless pieces, which you could pass down to your kids. I mean, if you take some of the clothes from like the I don't know, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, those can be so contemporary at the moment. And it's really not until we get to like the 80s, 90s, well, even 90s have come back as a trend. Um, maybe the early 2000s is really when we had just a hodgepodge of really trend-driven clothing where trends really shifted really rapidly um, in the matter of months where in the decades before, it took about 10 years to shift an entire fashion direction because people understood more of quality and and I think people just took better care of their clothing in the past. Before we get too far away from it, there was a question out there about your factory and wondering if you're catering to only hiring these, these groups. No, we're not. We are hiring all people, but we're consciously um, making an effort to have those people within the conversation because um, the people that don't have any representation, I mean, I've talked to a few people that have been incarcerated before and the obstacles that they face just to get a job or, or housing are are really almost ridiculous. And it, it just makes, it, I understand why they keep in the system because there's no support for them and we need to support all people, um, no matter what their backgrounds are. That's great. Um, can you talk to us about your process as you start the design work? So as I start the design work, um, we really hone in on what's going on on our political climate and just figure out what needs to be addressed the most um, at this certain time. And the last collection um, we did on the climate crisis and what we as humans are doing to the Arctic Ocean. And unfortunately, people don't understand the delicate balance that 
that we as humans have with the Arctic Ocean. And we get 50% of our oxygen from phytoplankton in the ocean, which people think, yeah, you cut down the trees, that's, that's 40% of the oxygen in the world, but 50% actually comes from the ocean. And unfortunately, wealthy people with money are, tr are purposely, that's why you have the discourse in the conversation of climate change, if it's real or not, it's because wealthy people, it's one of the last places on earth that has resources and they're purposely trying to melt it. There's, there's no argument that. So you can just blame rich people for, for melting that. And unfortunately, it's going to make a lot of island nations and coastal areas uninhabitable because of the rise in sea levels. Um, and so it's going to, I mean, you see the fires in California. All of this is very connected. And if we're not more mindful, like we are going to be the cause of our own extinction for money. And yeah. that, that to me, is not anything that we should ex go extinct for, honestly. Yeah. So um, to, clarify, to clarify a little bit, you usually start your design work with um, a mission a theme, such mm -hmm. as in the, in the season finale of Project Runway, you had the, the Arctic is melting. Um, and then you're kind of inspired from there on on how you build out the product. Yeah, the the color palette and really how to tell stories with fashion, and that's a really hard thing to do, especially with such like complex um, inspirations. But once you really start developing collections, you do it over and over and over again. You really start honing in not only on your personal design aesthetic but how you can tell stories through clothing. And that's really, I guess that's when you start hitting your stride as a designer. And we did the entire collection as a solid, like pre-human, not touching it, it being pristine and having a representation of mother nature and just all the way through the collection to where it was melted and, and all we had was the ocean. But we are the question mark of, what is actually going to happen at that point is is what we're going to see in the future. Um, there's a question about which specific group are melting the Arctic. I think you're the, you're the wealthiest the wealthiest people that 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 honestly rule our world is the people that are wanting to melt it because there's there's not only a lot of like diamonds and gold and different mineral resources in the Arctic. There's oil. There's also, a, that's one of the last places where commercial fishermen can go and really like take advantage of the system. Um, and so they're looking at it from those three angles and also the route on a boat going from like the top of Canada to Russia um, will become a lot faster for transporting products. And they're looking at it from transporting products from China to the United States. And so they're looking at it just from a business perspective. And unfortunately, human beings and nature are never in those equations. They never equate those two things. And that's why in efficiency, you have to put human and nature in there because like we have fast fashion, all of these things developed from just wanting to make money. They never put people in that equation. Yeah. So um, do you still have a presence in Austin or are you now? Um, I go back and forth. I actually have a good client base in Texas just because that's where I'm from. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm always back and forth um, from, from New York and Texas. Okay, so I guess um, one of my themes for the semester, which I know we talked about a little bit, is, is this fact, first of all, we're remote, obviously, so this idea that jobs can be done anywhere and what New York has, has been an epicenter for fashion for a very long time, as, as is Paris and, and other places, but kind of what we're seeing is that now, you know, people have an opportunity to be a little bit more spread out. And I would just love to hear, you talked a little bit about what it's like for you designing up in Hudson, but love to hear a little bit about what it's like working out of Austin and, and how that is, how it compares to New York, I should say. Yeah, um, so I think what the coronavirus has shown us is that you don't have to be in any specific place to 
be successful in, in any job field. And I feel like it has also shown us how the, the people that kind of run our country try to control the narrative of that you have to be working at a corporate job or all of these different things. Um, and just, I don't know that that's, I feel like the people that run these giant corporations force um, this kind of like future, I don't know, I kind of look at them like future slaves. I'd rather people be doing what they love at home, making, creating whatever that makes them happy. And that we don't have, you don't have to go get a job at Amazon or anywhere else um, for the future of our country. And I feel like we're shifting back to how things used to be in our country a little bit more, where we used to make things, local communities were supported. There's so many different, um, like, economic inequalities and social uh, inequalities connected to this kind of like, you have to go get a job with a big company uh, kind of mentality. And this and coronavirus has kind of thrown that out the window. Um, that's why they're, they're also forcing like the kids to go back um, to school early and everything in person is because they need these people to go back and work their corporate jobs or their nine to five somewhere physically. And I feel like that's not the reality or the direction of our future. Like anybody can do it from home and you can have a better quality of life, interact with your kids more, yeah. um, go on a walk. Like there's so many of these different things. And I feel like as a country, I feel like that's why we're so unhappy is because we've lost track of what's important and, and profit margins is not what's important. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's almost, um, you know, open Pandora's box. Like, everyone was so afraid of what it would be like to be remote, and everyone was always so afraid if you had a certain uh, per two people in your company or so they're working from home, how lazy they might be or how disengaged. And I think everyone's kind of seen the opposite effect over the last six months, that people are interested in being engaged, uh, you know, and, and, and technology is there in the tools that it makes it very possible. Yeah, and I think we needed that technology component to remind us that we don't have to be at a certain place at one time and making money and making somebody richer. You can make yourself richer in this country. Um, and I don't know, I'm, like, I'm really, really against big corporations. No, I mean, you're an owner of your own company, so maybe you already felt this way anyway, but I know uh, something I've heard said by a lot of people is that there, the idea of the nine to six has kind of disappeared. So like this, this hard and fast work day, this idea that you can't take a break to eat lunch with your kids or whatever is gone. But on the flip side, there is this uh, expectation that, hey, if I ping you on Saturday afternoon, you actually are gonna be available because now we all know that you can be just as available on Saturday. <laughs> Um, have you felt that at all, or is that kind of your way of life anyway? You're a well, unfortunately, if you sign up for fashion, you are working nonstop. Um, that's just the reality of it. And we, our quality of life is that we're able to create w through our own truth and our own filter, and that's what makes us happy, so we don't mind working. I feel like if you find that thing that makes you super happy, um, it doesn't feel like work anymore. And that's really what everybody in the world needs to search for is that thing that doesn't feel like work anymore. And and you should only try to enrich yourself. And it, uh, it unfortunately has to be on your back, but um, I think you will not only live a better life, but just be a happier person. Well, taking it back a little bit, can you tell us about your time at FIT and, and you know, any of your salient experiences while you were there or any recommendations you have for students? Yeah, so FIT is, I think it's the best fashion school in the whole world. Like, it's amazing. The amount of programs that they have. <laughs> well, and I, I help a lot of the other schools, so I get to be privy to how their programs work. 
And really FIT has the best programs. I mean, just the specializations where the knitwear, leather, evening wear, um, intimates, children's, not a lot of schools, they're a lot more general when it comes to their programs. And so having those specialized uh, programs really gives you that kind of, um, kind of the edge on the industry. Um, I would highly recommend the uh, couture classes that they have at FIT. Um, even the, honestly, the leather making program's pretty amazing. And I still use my brother knitting machine um, to make knits for the collection. So like everything that I learned, I have taken and kind of stacked up everything else um, that I keep learning every day from making garments. Um, and so you're gonna get a really good foundation there. I just use every resource that the school offers for you to learn. Like, I know it's exhausting and you're doing a lot of projects, but once you get out of school, you, you, you can't go backwards. And everything that you learn, like just take your time and really put the focus in right now to build your foundation for whatever you want to do in the future. It's yeah. there. Yeah. And actually the remote aspect kind of opens up new opportunities that probably didn't exist when, when you were in school. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would recommend as an alumni of um, FIT that you've been able to take advantage of over the years? I actually just like going to the museum. Like yeah. the exhibits they have at FIT are spectacular and just going in there just to like refresh your brain and just to stimulate your brain. I always go back periodically when a new exhibit comes out because um, it just makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you always know you wanted to design women's wear? Or actually, I mean, I think it's new you're designing some men's wear, right? Well, I started designing men's wear for Cade. I mean, oh, okay. Cade makes me happy, and so we started incorporating menswear. But women, like, now it's a little bit different in terms of, like, the gamut of men's fashion. It has opened up a lot. But at the time when I was studying, there was no rules for women's fashion. It was just kind of like whatever fantasy you wanted to create, a woman could potentially wear that. Um, and that's kind of what excited me. And I just, I think I relate a lot more to feminine energy and like all of the amazing uh, things that you can do with femininity is so beautiful that um, that's really the, the world that, that I like to live in. Yeah. Okay. Um... So I want to talk with you a little bit about Project Runway. Um, for those of you who have, haven't viewed yet, you really are doing yourself a disservice, and you should. And um, Sergio mentioned his, um, his fiance or yeah, fiance. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, and he also makes an appearance, which is awesome, on the show. And you guys, it'll be really exciting to watch if you haven't yet. Um, but to that end, can you talk to us about the process about getting on to the show and then what the, what the show was like? Yeah, so um, they, so always think about your social media as a tool for business um, because people are always paying attention to your social media presence is honestly kind of like your uh, business card for the future. And so just make sure that everything that's up there is not only professional, but is a good representation of your work, because that's how Project Runway found me. They just contacted me through Instagram and they were like, are you interested in this TV show? And I was like, mm. I, I thought it was a joke at the beginning because um, I didn't know, I hadn't seen it in a very long time. Um, and so a few months passed by and they kept messaging and, and I was like, okay, well, I guess these people are serious. Um, and I went on that show wanting to talk about one social issue per episode. So every garment that I created had a social message. Um, sometimes they let me speak about it. Sometimes they didn't let me speak about it. 
but at the end of the day, I just wanted not only to push um, the audience to think about these things going on within our country, but also push the judges, push everybody um, so that they can do more. Um, unfortunately, our fashion industry, the facade is very beautiful, but the behind the scenes is actually kind of gross, ugly, and very selfish. Um, and we need to be, fashion can always be at the forefront of change, depending on how you deliver the message, but we need to really clean up the, the back room of fashion and inspire people that they can be socially and ethically responsible while creating, but also make huge changes in the world. We should treat people better um, and really solve a lot of these social issues um, with fashion. I mean, you can have all of these different conversations um, just by presenting people with beautiful things. So that's that's honestly the only reason I went on that show. Um, and hopefully if you watch the show, um, that, that comes across um, in the episodes. What did you find to be about the best part of the experience in the end? Um, the best part of the experience at the end. Um, I think I pushed a lot of the judges to be more, uh, to do more with their platforms. Um, uh, Carly Claus started uh, campaigning for Joe Biden, and that was something that, like, I, I would literally have conversations with these people and tell them, like, y'all need to be doing more instead of just sitting there trying to look pretty. Like, who cares about that? Um, our world is falling apart right now, and y'all have the, the, the presence to really make change within our country. And so it's really, if you're in a power position, you should be using it for good. And the little power I had, I tried to use it. I feel like you've touched a little bit, but in, what do you feel like was the most challenging part of the show for you? Um, I think the most challenging part is editing when it comes to television, because mm, most of it was exaggerated into the kind of the opposite of what I was saying. So they, the main focus, unfortunately, of television is profits um, yeah and so it's just there to create drama for the audience's entertainment so probably the editing was was just something that I didn't feel not only was fair but it wasn't correct yeah um, were you surprised by the winner or by the end of the experience, I honestly didn't even care. <laughs> honestly, <laughs> I, I love Jeffrey to death, and I'm happy that they picked him. But it's it's honestly a mentally exhausting experience, and by the end of it, you just want it to be over. Like, yeah. It, yeah, it's I, a lot. I know you you touched on that with me last semester, but tell them a little bit about what your days were like. Oh my god. <laughs> Like, and there's a person who has like a breakdown on your show on this season and you after you guys were explaining it to me I'm like you can see why that happened yeah you don't really get to sleep um, at any point the food quality is not the best um, you work in very uh, I guess time restrictive environment so normally None of the things that we create in reality, we should be able to make them um, because it's 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 I mean, if y'all as y'all are doing your projects, like making a garment in one day from pattern to finish to runway, it's not a reality. So um, it's just a lot of stress and they create it to create drama for the show. Really, that's what it comes down to. Um, I try to use it in a different way. The good thing is I've had 20 years of experience. So 
creating the the stuff actually wasn't the stressful part. It was more uh, dealing honestly with the judges' personalities. That's really what was more stressful to me than everybody else was super nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. My uh, from from the show, it's very obvious, and on, uh, and obviously from looking at your site as well, that you yourself have really impactful coloring. Just wondering where along the way you feel like you picked that up or, or what you can attribute that to. I mean, I, I definitely picked it up at the Met. That was the one skill that, that unfortunately, I didn't get at FIT. Um, and that, that was like, I worked there probably for about two years, just like day in and day out doing tailoring for the Opera House. And it, it does take about that long doing it like that for you to get into a place where you become an expert, honestly. Yeah. Well, you shine for sure. <laughs> <laughs> How do you keep yourself informed of the latest trends? Give me good tips for that. Keep informed of the latest trends. So I think, I think, um, Cade likes to say, um, like what's going on a little bit more in terms of like a celebrity and all of that a little bit more. And I literally, as I'm creating all of this stuff, I only listen to politics and we just kind of talk about which direction we should go. But I don't really, I think if something's really beautifully classically made, it's you, I don't know. You don't really need to follow trends. Yeah. Yeah. And and how do you get inspired? Are you inspired by the just politics? politics. Yeah, politics and history. Um, those are two things. Like, if you know history, you should not repeat the same mistakes in the future. But also when you study politics, you see how many times we make the same mistakes over and over again. Um, and so it's just about holding these people accountable for these mistakes that they make every single 10 years, honestly. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about one of the most interesting places that work has brought you travel-wise? I think the coolest place, when I was at FIT my senior year, FIT actually sent me to China to represent them in a design competition. Oh, that's awesome. And un like the scary thing, it was actually in Wuhan where the, where the <laughs> coronavirus um, originated, but it was so long ago. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was actually weird. It was actually a little bit like Project Runway. You had to go through like, different levels to make it to the finals and they had 50 designers from every top fashion school around the world and we competed in all of these crazy competitions to get to like the for you to show your collection on the final show which was really cool wow that's great and who's the most interesting person you've met throughout your career who's the most interesting person i've met Huh. I don't think I've met that person yet. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I, I, I think I like meeting activists um, that are making a real change in, in the world. And unfortunately, we sometimes we as people get lost on the glitz and the fame of famous people and what they're doing but that to me doesn't interest me i i want to see somebody really making changes with their platforms um and that's like like i really want to meet uh aoc like that's a person that i i am truly inspired or like greta thunberry um the climate activist the young climate activist like those types of people are how we all need to be for the future. And I could care less what Kim Kardashian is wearing. Yeah. <laughs> Very refreshing. <to> hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I guess my, my final question for you before I turn it over to the students who I feel like are chomping at the bit, if the chat is any uh, <laughs> indicator, um, is what, what your biggest piece of advice would be for students who are looking to launch their own company. So my biggest advice is just figure out what makes you happy. Um, and that can be in so many aspects with our industry. There's a million jobs within our industry or a million career paths. Um, so if you want to design children's socks, like there's room for everybody. Um, it, you just need to find the thing that like wakes up and makes you feel so alive and so happy and really focus on that and never let our industry bring you down at any point. Um, just keep going and one day it will, it will be something that is fruitful for you. That's great. <laughs> Well, you guys, um, if you want to raise your hands, I'll call on you guys in the order that you do. Um, Bridget, you have one up from a long time ago. I don't know if you still have a question. Bridget Bellavia. Yeah, I do. Hi. Hi, Bridget. Hi. I have, <laughs> I have two questions. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so my first question is, what do you think is the most sustainable types of fabric? Because I know that even natural fabrics don't really um, compost, um, they're put into a landfill, they can also last as long as plastic. And then we have stuff um, such as uh, uh, rayon, you know, it could be like soil erosion, everything, the trees, cotton, uh, same for the cotton. So I'm just wondering what you think is the most sustainable fabric to use. And then my other question is do you have any advice for people who are trying to start up with a beautiful brand? don't really have a, a big budget. Okay. Yeah, so actually one of the most sustainable textiles that we have, um, and unfortunately it's been outlawed for a long time because of the DuPont, um, when they developed uh, their pantyhose, they outlawed, like the war on drugs started because DuPont wanted to outlaw hemp. Um, because it was a competing um, uh, textile that would create pantyhose. And DuPont had a the license on the chemical equation for, um, I'm like having trouble remembering what um, the textile they had in the 40s, but they had, they owned it. And nylon. that's why, you what? Nylon? What's yeah, nylon, yeah, nylon, yeah, um, nylon. The, and they so they had they own nylon and they didn't want anything competing against their their pantyhose crop so they started the war on drugs and really honing in on making marijuana and all of these things in a very negative light um so hemp's actually it grows very quickly um you it doesn't need as much water and if you if the it actually comes down to the textile manufacturer because sometimes they can, the way they dye it can still be a little bit of uh, polluting. Um, so the, the manufacturer of the textile should provide transparent information about at, at each process, what is going on to that uh, fabric. Um, so if you look at Sapima, they actually have a, um, a transparency system in place from the farm all the way to the in use of how and what they put. And some of the products are very sustainable, some of them are not, but they let you know what part of the process was not sustainable. And the transparency is really the key um, of how we're going to make a more sustainable future for our industry because one little component, even with hemp, you could still damage a whole ecosystem. Does that answer your first question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> um, if you are a, a small designer trying to uh, create your own company, um, you just have to learn anything and everything about garment construction and just start doing all of the processes yourself. Like Kate and I have created a business and we do it on our own backs. We don't um, outsource anything. 
um, because we can say, hey, this is ethically made because nobody's getting taken advantage of. We know how much work we've put into it. Um, so as long as you're able to do all of the work at the beginning, you can create a business because you're not relying on anyone. And that's really what it comes down to. Because as soon as you a component that you're not familiar with, you have to outsource, it becomes expensive at the beginning, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right. So learn your patterns, learn how to sew, um, learn how to do everything. Honestly, it's also going to be your greatest power because if you do decide to grow your company larger, nobody can ever take advantage of you because you know your business inside and out. Um, Walaka, you next. Okay. Hi. 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 Um, so I have two questions. Um, so when you first wanted to be like, I want to make a sustainable company, did you ever find it overwhelming at first? Because like, like you said earlier, it is more expensive and it does, it is more of like a gradual like uphill battle with it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so like, what was like overwhelming about it? And then like, how did you find like vendors in the sense of like finding your fabrics and making sure it stayed consistent being ethically and sustainably made? So I honestly, I never found it overwhelming just because if you do your research and you really put the effort into it, it's just like going to FIT, it's hard. Like no matter anything that you do in life, if it's of quality, it's not going to be easy. Um, and so never look at it like that. It's just about learning um, what the processes are. And when we create all of our garments, we use dead stock fabrics. So sometimes there's 500 yards of the, gar of the textile. Sometimes there's two yards. So we're just more mindful of how much we can create with that but we don't use anything new um, to create. So there is, I mean, our industry creates so much waste across the board. And so we try to take as much out of it so that it doesn't end up in landfills or like a lot of the stuff that even gets donated like to Goodwills and things actually ends up in other countries destroying their, their um, kind of their local community that's creating garments and stuff because they can just go and get stuff for free. And so not only does the decisions we make for clothing impact us here locally where you're living, but once that garment goes somewhere else, um, it also impacts other places and it could damage an entire um, uh, financial ecosystem in another place. And so one thing that we do also is that once the garment leaves our atelier, if um, the client no longer wants it or doesn't have a need for it, we'll actually take it back, repair it, and either resell it on our site or we repair it. And if it's not sellable, then we find a women's shelter and we donate it to the women's shelter. So we, yeah, so we're responsible even after our garment leaves. And that's something for the future of all designers um, that we have to be mindful of whatever we create all the way around. We don't have that option anymore. Thank you. You're welcome. I read an article this week about how Burberry is actually raising funds to make themselves more sustainable. And that, you know, they they were in the news a couple years ago for being burning their products. Their products. Yeah, which is so crazy that. You have that much money. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of gross. Yeah, it's gross. I guess they've made a big effort to donate their product now to um, <laughs> an organization that's like Dress for Success, but it's British. I can't remember the name. Smart, smart something. But anyway. Well, and, and that's. Well, that's and, you can do if you try. <laughs> and, and that's what uh, another thing that I really want to stress to all the people in this call is that y'all should be buying each other's clothes and investing in the future of y'all's um, businesses instead of buying this designer clothes that they're literally burning and 
they have too much money. They need to like come down to reality um, when it comes to their businesses. And you need to support like your friends, your people around you. Quit, quit buying that. It's honestly junk. Yeah. It's expensive junk. Um, Claire, I have you next. Okay, so your website says that you learned old world draping when you were working in theater. Mm -hmm. How is that, like, what is that, and how is it different than what we learned at FIT? Well, once you're, F okay, so in FIT, they really program you to kind of, and it might have changed because I graduated in 2007, but the only draping that you're, like, have access to is draping for like a size two model. And when you drape for, are, are you familiar with opera? Okay, yeah. so they have like very, very different bodies. And to drape for, let's say like, like a gentleman with like a very large belly, it's completely different. Even the way that you have to like design a silhouette to make it look very flattering is like a very different way of thinking because a size two mannequin is actually very easy. Like that's easy. So you can create a lot of beautiful things, but when you start draping for real people, it, it like literally changes the way you think about design. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, up next I had Gabriella. Hi, Sergio. Thank you so much for being here. I, I have two questions for you. Mm -hmm. Well, but, but first of all, let me just say how, how grateful I am for, for everything that you shared today because I've been at FIT for about a year now and, and I came in to be a sustainable fashion designer and, and you, you, your lecture seriously illuminated so, so many questions that I had, but also it was my first real exposure to something related to sustainability in the program which is heartwarming, so I'm very grateful for not just me, but my <laughs> classmates. Um, <laughs> but the two questions I had are, number one, uh, where did you source your dad's stock fabrics? And, uh, and uh, I'm assuming you also use dead stock notions and um, right thread, all those things. Um, mm -hmm. And as what, and the, the second question is, um, how do you handle the spills from your garment production? because you're not fully zero waste, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how do you guys handle that part of it? So there's jobbers um, within our industry. One of the best uh, stores, actually Mood is actually a jobber. They, they literally buy the leftovers from the industry. Now it's not financially, um, like they mark up their fabrics quite a lot. b and is actually, carries a lot of leftover fabrics but there's lots of smaller stores um that just deal with middlemen they'll buy the leftovers from i don't know europe asia all of these places and then they have warehouses in new jersey that you can go and source fabrics a a textiles is a great resource they will only let you buy fabrics if you have a tax id so that's the only thing that you will run into um, as a problem. Um, they might, if you take cash, they might let you buy fabrics, um, but that's really the only way. But there's a lot of jobbers in New Jersey because that's where a lot of the, the textile industry has left because New York got too expensive for them to survive there. Um, I use Guterman's uh, recycled thread I don't know if y'all are familiar, but Guterman makes, that was the only obstacle that I ran into is that I could, that's the only new thing that I couldn't get around. You can't recycle the thread. Like I can't take the thread off of garments and use it again. It's very difficult. Um, but Guterman does make recycled thread. So that's something that ha has been alleviated. Um, and then, sorry, what was your third question? or the last question. Oh, uh, uh, how do you handle spills from your garment production? Oh, we actually create artwork, um, which I don't, I don't know if I have pictures of it, but you can look on my Instagram. Sometimes I'll be standing and doing Instagram stuff with it in the background, but all of the leftovers, we make art with it. 
Amazing. Thank you. That, that's what I do too. I, I, yeah, I'll check yours out. Thank you. <laughs> um, we do. We actually, they're really expensive. So um, it is a good way that sometimes people don't live the life to have extravagant garments sometimes, but you can always have an extravagant piece on your wall. Um, and like we have one above our bed, we have one in our living room that just makes us happy every day. Um, and I know creating is, is really like enriches your soul. That's really what it comes down to. Great. Thank you, Gabriela. Um, Alyssa, I have you next. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm just curious if there was like anything you wish you would have done differently, like in your career so far, or hmm. it's all just gone. <laughs> I don't think so. I think I've like, um, like minus working at the Met, I've never worked for anybody. Um, just because I would hear the horror stories of other younger people working for designers. And I don't understand why anybody would be an asshole on, on this planet. And especially when you're creating, like why bring that energy into that process? And so I just knew that I never wanted to work for anybody. Um, and I feel like that's why I feel just as passionate as I did before I got into fashion school about fashion is because I was never jaded by another unhappy person within our industry. So don't ever let anybody make you not like what you love to do because there are those people within our industry. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. thank you. Good, You're welcome. Um, Ken, are you still there? There she is. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a question. Is yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, I have a question. What is your strategy build and and own brand? Okay. Can you repeat that what, for me one more time? What Sorry. is your suggestion? Uh, what is your suggestion to build an own brand? Oh, okay. Um, you mean new brand? I, I want to make a own business. So what is your suggestions? My, my suggestion start, is just, to start to build. yeah, just learning everything that you can while you're at FIT. And that not only comes down from garment construction, but also there is a lot of great business classes that FIT offers. I mean, I think one of the degrees that you can get in FIT is fashion business. So just make sure that you balance out the construction classes with business classes, if that's the direction you want to go. But right now is really the time that you just kind of have to like put all the effort that you can in terms of learning. And I know, a lot of you are maybe young and want to go have fun and do all these things and there's nothing wrong with that but just make sure that once you get out of fit you feel like you've gotten um everything that you needed to get out of it and that just comes with hard work um so first i just wanted to like have a comment and the second one is a question um okay. i just wanted to let you know that the dress that you had that was strapless with the reflective applique in your um final collection for project one right it literally made me emotional it was so beautiful and i just wanted to let you know that oh <laughs> that's so sweet thank you <laughs> of course and then the second question i had was Basically, I am a one year student here, but I'm also a student at the University of Delaware and I'm minoring in sustainability and textile innovations. What would your advice be for a sustainable designer going into the industry? Um, I think you just need to learn. You need to focus more also on learning how textiles are created 
and knowing what the impact not only socially and that comes from like how much people are being paid to create this textile or the garment or whatever it is but also what what is its impact on that local environment because uh, they they literally throw dyes and chemicals into waterways of these other countries that's that is why unfortunately china is so polluted is because of the lack of regulations and and you only like those things don't go away sometimes you can poison something so badly that it's unrepairable i mean if you look at our oceans the only reason that we have mercury or the fish have mercury inside of them is because of mining around the world they've dumped that the excess material into our waterways and so that mercury didn't come from thin air it actually came from mining around the world and like now our our oceans are, are really screwed up just from that one thing alone not not let alone all the other problems that we've caused with microplastics or um, microfibers are so like it's literally in all of our water we drink it already so it's about learning how all of these things are connected and they are they're literally all connected and you just have to be mindful of when you're creating that you're not contributing to that system that's already doing all of the damage. Okay, so if I were to want to seek a company instead of making my own brand, what would your advice be for that? Um, I mean, there are, there are quite a few sustainable, um, I would definitely recommend smaller sustainable companies because the bigger ones are not sustainable, even if no matter how much they yell and scream sustainability, um, they're, they're not sustainable. So it's just finding a smaller brand that is transparent with you. If there's ever a time where they can't answer one of your questions about how they make things, they're giving you, they're not sustainable, period. So just ask a lot of questions. That's really how we are going to make these changes is holding not only these larger companies accountable, but designers like y'all need to, to be able to answer those simple questions. And unfortunately, we should not invest in people doing it the wrong way. We've, we've already been doing that too long. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, who else? I have you next. Hi. Um, this How do you keep your company in a financially um, approach way through the crisis of like uh, in the economic um, environment, such as like back in 2008 where we had the financial crisis, and then this year that we have a um, coronavirus situation? Like, how do you keep up your with your business? And what is your approach? Terms. Okay, I think I heard half your question because you cut out a little bit, but so I did live through the 2008 recession and I came out of school like right at that point. And the, the, the scary thing that it had taught me is that people that buy expensive garments, which are the, the wealthiest people around the world, they have exorbitant amount of money and they're probably never going to run out of it they could they could literally fund so many things to make our country better but they won't and so the price point that i sell at i sell usually about only two dresses a month and i'm able to not only support my business but make a, a pretty decent living and i've tapped into a market um that is at the highest price point, but also having conversations with the wealthiest people in the world, I literally have opened their eyes up and been like, hey, y'all need to stop doing this. I was like, and sometimes I've told clients, I'm like, I'm not selling to you anymore because this is not, that you're not taking this very seriously. So I think that they like that they're investing their money in somebody doing the right thing for all of the bad stuff that they're actually on the back end um, business-wise. 
and and that's just how I've developed my business. Um, but it is, I, I mean, I have changed a lot of wealthy, wealthy people's minds of how they treat the world, not as a piggy bank, but as something that we have to have a symbiotic relationship with. And that's just, I, I feel like that's what I'm contributing to the world. I don't know. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, Brittany Wiener, I have you next. Brittany, can you hear me? Can you see me yeah. and hear me? Hi. 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 Yeah. I saw I was like crazy that I'm talking to you, and it's really cool. <laughs> So one of my questions was answered. It was going to be kind of like, you know, the value of working for other people and you know, how you go straight into seeing it on your own. But I was really curious, um, like how soon do you kind of have to, you know, come up with that business model when you're going to go in an entrepreneurial way? Like how soon do you have to know, like, everything business-wise? How soon do you partner with someone, those types of things? Um. I would highly recommend you not partner with anybody. Um, I think you need to figure out your own direction or have mentors that can get you on the right path first because things get messy the more people that get involved. Like that's why a lot of the bigger designers are very unhappy and bitchy and like not are mean people. It's because they have that financial backer, like literally breathing down their neck 24 yeah. seven. Like, why aren't this selling? What, what's going on with this? And it, it just, it just like kills the creative process. Like fashion is just so boring right now. There's nothing. It's just empty. And you can start a business by figuring out a place where people are not addressing. And that's like finding a niche market. That's why I said like a kid socks, find something very specific that makes you happy and you can build a business out of that. If you try to go the traditional route of like making huge collections and all of this craziness, it's going to just put you in debt and not, it's not the reality for, your generation anymore y'all need to be very tight focused i mean literally you can make a career off of one or two products as long as those things are spectacular um yeah. and then you can do the fun stuff once you have a good foundational business set up thank you <laughs> and for your students we can anybody can dm me on instagram and i usually will get back to them if they ever have a question about sustainability or anything so that's I'm offering that to everybody because I know that's not something that that FIT specializes in, but hopefully in the future that they do have this type of program. And I think we just hopefully have time, Sergio, for one more question. Um, I'll uh, whatever questions you'll have, I'm more than happy uh, to answer. Raquel was the next person I had. Hi, Sergio. Hi. Um, it's so nice to meet you and talk to you. Um, I just wanted to say I really just align with your vision and when watching Project Runway, I know that you said something, um, you made the statement that you were making politically driven music and that resonated with me so much. Um, and I have a question about you. So I know you said you work in the you also wanted to you know, within your manufacturer and wanted to continue or serve certain communities of people. It's a little bit hard to hear you. I don't know if you can closer to the microphone maybe it's just like very quiet now yeah it's a little better yeah okay I, uh, um so yeah with that being said like i know you said you go into colleges and then you wanted to serve certain communities in your manufacturing company um but i wanted to know how likely it was if ever you would ever have interns or mentorship um, for anybody who aligns that you felt aligned with your vision and with the values that were at the Yeah, we um when I was in South Street Seaport, we actually had like a ton, we actually had to turn away interns just because of the size of our space. 
because a lot of younger designers are very passionate about sustainability um, and there's not too many people doing sustainability at the level that I'm doing it. Um, and we're more than open to taking on interns. It's a little bit harder to do that during this time, but definitely in the future, if that's something you're interested in, we've just moved our operations up to Hudson. So that's the only obstacle that you're going to run into. But in the future, I would love to open up my atelier to any and every person that's interested in sustainability and furthering um, their construction. Like we kind of run the gamut here of everything that we can show you. Um, so it just depends on Corona, honestly, <laughs> that's what it comes down to, unfortunately. Yeah, understood. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And there was one more question in the chat. Um, Sharon asks, how long does it really take to make a collection? Um, obviously, on Project Runway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it honestly just depends on your price point. Um, like the fringe dress that the models twirled with on Project Runway, that's actually all sewn by hand, and it took about three months. Um, so if you're if you're in line with that type of garment, obviously it's going to take you a lot longer to finish a collection. But if it's ready to wear pieces, like I could probably finish a ready to wear collection within a month. Um, if it's a couture collection, definitely six months, just because of the amount of work. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sergio. It was so amazing to have you on and so exciting to hear about your new endeavors up in Hudson. And, <laughs> thank uh, you. We'll be following along on, on social media and uh, really, really appreciate everything. Thanks for being here. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome, guys. Y'all have a wonderful week. You too. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you, Sergio. Hi. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'm just going to flash in now for our, um, for our uh, attendance questions. So just take a peek at the screen and put me your email. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Okay. Um, professor, I have a quick question. Hello. She's gone. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I was gonna say, are we doing this question related to like what is Sergio doing or like what we personally are doing? This is about you. Um, my all attendance right. questions are all to get to know you guys a little better. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. And was that Kylie or Kylie? Did you have a different question? That was Brittany, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a question. Yes. Um, I think you said something about if you missed last class to stay after. If you missed the first class. Yeah, I thought this was the first class because of. Um, you mean like the first class two weeks ago where we had the syllabus? Yeah. Introduction. Okay, yeah. okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Um, Kylie, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so I found the lecture prep questions um, on Blackboard, and it says I didn't realize that it was for two um, two different designers that we meet with. So we just need to pick two designers and then submit those to you. Yes. Exactly. Throughout the course okay. of the semester, there will be. Um, 13 lectures and you just right. have to pick two people that you want to ask questions to prep four questions that you want to ask and make sure you ask one of them in the course of the lecture okay 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 thank you no problem sharon hi so i have this question and i'm a little um torn so um for the event project um, the event critique, there, 
yes, there is the documentaries we can watch. But and I'm not even sure how I did this. I just kept clicking away or whatever. But I have access through um, your your recommendation. The what is it? Bof uh -huh. um, took me through to Fashion Week. I I'm, I I can't map out <laughs> exactly how I did that. <laughs> but um, would that be comparable? Or do you really yeah. want us to watch it? Because no, some of it has no, interviews. It's, it's a um, whole new. In a non-COVID time, that's the ideal, <laughs> is that you would be attending one of these things live. Um, obviously, we're, I'm trying to make workarounds for the semester. So yeah, if you, if you do a live viewing or can engage in some way with a brand that's doing something unique for, for Fashion Week, that would be great to hear about. OK, only because it's actually I was I just just started and what I was watching was really um, well, first of all, you get to go to Fashion Week. I was like, whoa, but um, really interesting on how well what I saw, how how they're doing these shows. Yeah, not not live. It's just it's a very interesting time and there's going to be a lot of interesting things I think happening out there to try to keep people engaged when. They can't be there in person, so. Um, yeah, I mean, one designer. Sorry. No, I'm sorry, because when I, we talk, I can't hear each other. No, one designer actually mo was a model. Oh. His show. No, so it, it, it. That's cool. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, there's all kinds of. He, it was just him and another person because you can edit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's great. Very. And cool. so it was one guy and one girl, and it was him because he had a little. Um, you know, a, a conversation before, and then he did this show, and it was really very impressive. But I was like, "Oh, this is a whole nother thing." Uh, you yeah. know, it's, it's very cool, and you're kind of probably picking up on different personalities that you wouldn't normally get to see, which is cool. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so I, I'll, I'm going to continue watching those, and I'll watch the documentary. I think I've already watched a couple on your list. Can you do the Dior one? Uh, um, Yes, my request yeah. is that you do something uniquely for this class, but um, something that has happened, you know, that you that you have done since August 29th to to fulfill the credit. Like, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Well, okay. All right. I actually watched that um, at the end of last semester. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It doesn't count, but that's okay. That's okay. I want to watch them because I find it very, you know, you learn. Totally. Um, so, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Have a good and, week. Uh, yeah, you too. Um, Raquel, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, so on Blackboard, I, I know that you said if we brought a guest, we get extra credit, I believe. Um, Is that what the points meant? That, where are, did you, uh, that is um, not the case for this semester. So I'm wondering if okay. that's something course information because yeah. we're not, because we're not live we're not doing that for extra credit um this semester i'm choosing the best attendance question answers from each week and oh okay and if you're chosen for that or you know if you have the best answer then i will add a point to your final exam okay great did we have the attendance question for today yes it's the one that's live on the screen right now okay got it yeah oh okay sorry i had my screen switch okay. no okay. thank you okay no problem Brittany, did you have a question? Yeah. I'm trying to share my video again. Um, so for the, I think it was with, um, I'm not sure who was speaking before, but if there is like a live online fashion event, for instance, because of Fashion Week, we can do a small write-up on that. And that, do would be, that would be the ideal. Absolutely. That would be the ideal. Okay. How long of like a detailed write-up do you want? The the template is posted online. Oh, the template's posted. Okay. And then my other question was the state of fashion for 2020. That was with, for the take-home exam. That's for the midterm, right? Or is that? Yes, exactly. So right. if you want to start reading it now, it will help you to do a better job at that when the time comes in November. Okay. So there's no, like, weekly homework besides, like, the questions, the documentary. It's just kind of, like, hitting all those things that we have to do? Yep. The fashion critiques are due by October 12th. You have to do two of those. And then the lecture prep questions, you have to choose two lectures before the last lecture on the December 14th. Okay. Okay. Thank you.
Mariel, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. Um, are we going to have meetings with you or do we need to schedule meetings with you um, about like, I don't, I remember in the two weeks ago, you said we were going to have like one on one meetings. So. Yes. Thank you. That's a good point. I know there aren't many people left in the class still, but I will flip an email out to you guys on scheduling those um, this coming week. I wanted to make sure the roster was a little bit more finalized before I did that. So um, it's like a 15 to 30 minute session throughout the course of the semester. So I will put it out there. Thank you. Anyone else? 